This is 28 Magazine. In tonight's cover story, Rick Mason reports milk production in Pennsylvania has reached a record high, more than 10 billion pounds in one year. The state is fifth in the nation in milk production, but it may be too much of a good thing for some farmers. There's a new paper in town. Vince Sweeney takes us behind the scenes of the West Side Weekly. In our sports extra, Jim Miller in Grand Rapids and the near championship season for the Scranton Royals. And the waiting is over. Sid Michaels and wife Linda are parents. In the best of Gallagher's travels, it's welcome home, Lonnie Catherine. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the March edition of 28 Magazine. I'm Vic Vetters. About five years ago, the Pennsylvania General Assembly made it law. The official state beverage is milk. It was a tribute to the families in the most demanding of occupations, dairy farming. And in tonight's cover story, Rick Mason will tell us that sure, the demands are still there and they won't quit, but some dairy farmers will. In fact, by the end of the year, the state could lose a thousand dairy farms. Four o'clock in the morning on a cold winter's day, Dale Lavelle is on his way to work as one of Pennsylvania's 14,000 dairy farmers. With 130 milking cows, he operates one of the area's larger family farms. It's been in the family three generations. Dale and his wife Becky bought it from his father 10 years ago. Kenneth Lavelle continues to help out. Still, the typical workday lasts between 12 and 18 hours. When you're a farmer, you have to be a pair of veterinarian and a mechanic and a general Mr. Fix-It. You have to know about field work, nutrition for the cattle, and just about everything. And uh, it just takes a lot of money, time, and patience, and, and you end up with a gallon of milk on the shelf in the grocery store, and people just don't even think about what it took to get there. Just as in Kenneth's time, the cows need to be milked twice a day, 365 days a year. On this farm, even with automation, that one chore takes seven hours, split between early morning and late afternoon. The smooth rhythmic beat of the milk pumps belies the shaky future of many of these farm operations. As Dale explains it, something is drastically wrong. We're supposed to be around a million dollar operation, but uh, yet we live like paupers. Farm economists predict that six to eight percent of the dairy farms in the Northeast will go out of business this year. That's between 800 and 1,100 farms in Pennsylvania alone. There's several farms that I know of that are just hanging on. There's no doubt about it, uh, we cannot uh, keep operating the way we have been. They've been operating under a cost price squeeze. Their basic costs are rising while the milk prices being paid to them are falling. Just surviving uh, the next few years is uh, the, main, the main concern of most people out here in the dairy industry. Cattle feed is their largest single cost. There's high moisture corn, there's soybean, minerals, haylage, corn silage, and it's all in, uh, put in a mixer. And it's mixed, and then we uh, run it out to the cows. They eat uh, somewhere right around 65 pounds of that a, a day. Feed costs alone are expected to rise between 10 and 30 percent this year. Many other costs beyond the farmer's control are also jumping higher. Now to understand why they're getting less for their labors, we need to look at some historical trends. In one sense, dairy farmers may be victims of their own efficiency. In 1950, 22 million cows were producing an average of 5,700 pounds of milk per year. 30 years later, there were only 11 million cows, half as many, but they were producing 13,000 pounds each a year. This one, in two years when she starts milking, will be producing about 18,000 pounds of milk a year. So fewer and fewer cows keep making more and more milk. To reduce the number of cows, the government conducted a dairy herd buyout program last year. 1.2 million dairy cows went to slaughter. That helped some, but nationally there remains a milk surplus. Not in the Northeast, there's a shortfall in the Northeast. Unfortunately, when farm legislation is written, it's written for the country as a whole. And it doesn't take into to consideration the plight of the farmer in the Northeast. The USDA sets federal price supports, minimums that milk processors must pay the farmers. That figure is determined by how many billions of pounds of surplus milk the government buys. Those supports have been dropping since 1983, though consumer costs have remained fairly steady. Currently, Milk is selling at $2 a gallon uh, out of store. That's at the same level it was back in the late 70s. 
So milk really has been a bargain for the last 10 years, and it continues to be so. The price of milk uh, in the store hasn't changed, uh, and our price has dropped uh, near three dollars so far, and the price in the store hasn't uh, reflected that at all. One retired dairy farmer suggests the solution lies with the middleman. The, the consumer is willing to pay a fair price for that farmer, but getting it back to the farm where, it's, where the milk is made and where it's shipped out of here seems to be the problem. Where's most of the profit going? We believe that the handlers, the processors, are keeping more than their fair share and not delivering it back to the farmer. To get a fair price for their labors, many farmers in the Northeast are banding together and joining cooperatives. One of them is known as the RCMA. The sole purpose of the co-ops is to market the milk at premiums over the federal minimum price levels. In effect, it's a legalized form of price setting. What RCMA is attempting to do is market-wide pool. Every handler pays the same, every producer is paid the same. Almost every milk handler is paying premiums to ensure a continuous supply of milk. Now you may ask, why not let free market forces, the laws of supply and demand, take over? Governor Bob Casey, for one, says it would hurt us all. Well, it would be, uh, it would be disastrous, and it would be something that uh, we certainly would not want to see occur. And we'd want to do everything we possibly can to prevent it. Casey says Pennsylvania will support all efforts to help agriculture. You see, dairy farms are labor-intensive small businesses, but as a whole, they're big business in the state. In fact, dairy farming is the biggest. Agriculture is a big generator of spin-off jobs. 20% of all Pennsylvania jobs are ag-related. The demise of dairy farms unchecked would be a substantial blow to the overall economy. On top of that, protection for farmers preserves a local supply of milk. Milk processor Albert Stokula says it's in the customer's best interest to keep local dairy farms alive. The effects of returning to the farmer a, a, a price that is profitable to him, and he stays in business, then we will be guaranteed a supply. And if we don't, uh, milk could conceivably be much more costly in the near future. So how to get farmers a reasonable return for their labors while preserving an adequate supply of affordable milk for consumers? The answer lies in lowering the national surplus of milk to the point where it isn't too expensive for the government and so large that it depresses prices to the farmer. How do you accomplish that? Well, three factors determine a surplus. The number of cows making milk, the amount of milk each cow makes, and consumption. Milk's a part of it all. Milk. You've no doubt seen the dairy promotions. They're helping to boost consumption an average of 2% a year. But cow output increases 2.5% to 3% annually. With Coca-Colas and Budweiser's competing for belly space, the long-term solution lies in reducing the number of cows. How? Well, price cuts is one way. Farmers in the Northeast are too familiar with those. But they're inefficient. You get rid of farmers by forcing them out of business, but typically most of their cows end up in someone else's herd. Some people suggest mandatory controls. So I think uh, the dairy farmer has to go on a quota system as far as his production is concerned. Each farmer will have to be assigned uh, so many pounds of milk that he can produce within a period of a year, and if he overproduces, then he should be penalized, and penalized to the point of uh, maybe receiving three or four dollars a hundredweight versus if he stays within his quota receiving fourteen or fifteen dollars a hundredweight. The long-term answer probably will fall somewhere in between. Some combination of price cuts, voluntary controls, mandatory controls. But the net effect has to be the same, getting rid of some cows. Sometime in 1989 or 90, a new dairy bill will be debated in the Congress. One farmer told our reporter Rick Mason, all we want to do is make a decent living. Up next, there's a new business in town, and it's off to a good start. We'll go behind the scenes when 28 Magazine returns. Let's start a newspaper. Many people who work in television have said that at one time or another, but to really do it for a living, that's something else. Well, somebody did start a newspaper in the Wyoming Valley a couple of months ago, and right now, Vince Sweeney takes us behind the scenes for the new paper in town. 
The contributions of a free press to the American way of life are immeasurable, dating back hundreds of years. This time around on 28 Magazine's Behind the Scenes, we're going to take a look at the West Side Weekly, a paper that dates back three months. Wednesday. It will be in Wednesday, March 16th. Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. This is Dottie Martin, who along with Susan DeDurka runs this Young Weekly from offices along the avenue in Kingston on the west side of the Susquehanna. The paper's coverage area is the Wyoming Valley West School District and the nine boroughs comprising it. Well, when I first started in the newspaper business, I started with a community newspaper in Pittston. Um, later working for a daily newspaper and then moving into another community newspaper and I found that that's really where my interest was because it gives you, a, a community newspaper gives you an opportunity to become close to the people in the area that you're serving. Uh, because I live in Forty Ford and because Susan has lived in Forty Ford all of her life and because there is no weekly newspaper covering the West Side communities, we felt that there was a need for it. The need was not for another major newspaper in the Wyoming Valley. Both Martin and Dedurka are emphatic about this and make it clear that the West Side Weekly is not in competition with the dailies it is sold alongside of on local newsstands. We view our product as a supplement to the already two existing daily newspapers. We don't expect anyone to buy our newspaper and not read a daily newspaper. The first issue of the West Side Weekly was seen by the public on December 9th of 1987 and in its short existence has become popular with the people it was intended to be popular with. We go from Swearsville down to Plymouth. Um, we are not looking to expand our area right now or even next year. West Side Weekly's lack of grand ambition appears to be founded on a genuine and sincere desire to give the people what they want. Local stories about local people, neighbors writing about neighbors. Susan Dedurka seems to know what is wanted, and perhaps more importantly, what is not. Um, a lot of people are not interested in national news, hardcore news. Some people just want to know what's going on in their immediate community. And this is what we want to give the people, community news. Um, school news you know, is, is a big interest also. You know, there's a, a lot of uh, things going on in, in the local school districts that uh, aren't covered by the daily papers. In those daily papers, a lot of space goes to sports, national and local. There's a lot they can cover day to day, but there's still plenty left for the weekly to take a closer look at. John Owinski, by his own admission, a sports nut, is the West Side Weekly's sports director. What we try and do is intensify the coverage over here. Uh, we cover the four high schools. Uh, Valley West, O'Reilly Tech, and uh, Wyoming Seminary. So what we do is a lot of feature type stories, uh, preview stories, that sort of thing. The paper is put together in Kingston. All of the reporting, writing, paste up, and darkroom work along with the West Side Weekly's advertising. But the actual paper itself is printed a considerable distance away in Bradford County's Tawanda. From the west side to Tawanda, and then back to the newsstands of the people it aims to serve, the West Side Weekly's owners, Dottie Martin and Susan Dedurka, are confident they know what a community newspaper should be. Chicken dinners and uh, church suppers and firemen's bazaars and children in school and the things that they're doing. Um, just hometown community things. Things that people would cut out of our newspaper to put into a scrapbook. Our Jim Miller has a scrapbook of his own, and it's filled right now with plenty of clippings about the University of Scranton Royals. And up next on 28 Magazine, our Sports Extra, and Jim will share with us some special memories. Last fall, at the start of the basketball season, Scranton Royals coach Bob Beswar said, we will win a national championship. In tonight's Sports Extra, Jim Miller reports the Royals missed by just one game. The University of Scranton Royals backed up their coach's confidence all season long as they entered the Division III National Championships with an overall record of 28 and 2 and ranked number one in the country. Head coach Bob Beswar had that special feeling about this year's club and they took it all the way. I think the experience of the players we had back, proven winners like Trippett and Draco, Gallagher, Downey, these guys had been in tournament play before and they understood what it was like to win. I, I don't know if they told you their motto, follow the seniors, they know how to win, but we taught them how to win. The road to a possible third national championship once again led the University of Scranton Royals back to Calvin College here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. 
The Royals under head coach Bob Bessemer won the national championship in 1976, again in 1983. And to a man, they felt they had the kind of talent to challenge for the Division III title. Step number one against Hartwick College out of New York. The Royals came out red hot in game number one and established control of the action right away. And it was just a matter of time before they would knock off Hartwig 84-61 in advance of the championship showdown. J.P. Andrako, Sean Gallagher, and Art Trippett led the way, and the win put Scranton in the showdown for that national championship. How does this feel now? You're one away. It's a great feeling. I mean, I don't know if it hit me yet or not. I'm just a little bit in shock, but uh, I can't wait for tomorrow night, and I'm excited. Well, we came in the uh, favorites, and... Uh... We just knew we had to go out and execute, and when we came out and we, we started running the offense, playing tough day, we had a feeling inside that we were going to come away with the win. It feels good. It feels really good to win, but it still feels like halftime, you know. I mean, <laughs> we got one more to go, and that's really the thing that's up most on our minds. In a battle of giants, the NCAA's Division III National Championship came down to one final game of basketball before another packed house here at Calvin College. The number one ranked University of Scranton Royals would go for their 30th win of the year and the national championship against high-powered Ohio Wesleyan. The battling bishops behind the torrid shooting of Scott Tedder raced out to a 21-point first-half lead, and the Royals spent the rest of the night simply trying to catch up. Ohio Wesleyan fought back the challenge of the Royals and went on to win the national championship. But in defeat, the University of Scranton Royals had a great sense of pride and wore second place with great dignity. This is just the greatest experience of my life. Um, tonight's my best night. Most people don't even have a chance to get here, and we were here. We had a great time while we were out here, and uh, you know, I wouldn't trade it in for anything. And finally, it's an experience for the kids, something that they will always cherish. Oh, yeah, they had a marvelous weekend here. The people were really good to us, and uh, they walked around with their eyes wide open. They were loving every minute of it. Uh, I'm sure they would want to win this game, but looking back, they'll look at their watch and see, hey, we were the second team in the nation. Not bad. So in the quiet of the Calvin College Gymnasium, your NCAA Division III national champions have been crowned the battling bishops of Ohio Wesleyan. For the University of Scranton Royals, they finish in second place, but with the best winning record in Division III, 29-3. and three. From the NCAA's Division III National Championships in Grand Rapids, Michigan, for 28 Magazine, I'm Jim Miller. You know, Coach Bestwar has another prediction. We will be back in the Final Four in two years. Up next on 28 Magazine, the best of Gallagher's travels. This segment of 28 Magazine, the best of Gallagher's travels, is dedicated to all those young couples who wait and wait to adopt a child. For many, it is hopeless, but for some, they are now starting to look outside the country, to Korea. In fact, this past month, Dan Gallagher traveled to New York with some young couples. Among them, our own Sid Michaels and his wife, Linda, as they welcomed home their baby, Lonnie Catherine. Well, it is rigorous. Um, adoptive families have a great deal of fortitude. They're, you know, very quality families. It's something we're seeing more and more of these days, American parents adopting Korean children. Here in Pennsylvania alone, Catholic Social Services finds homes for close to 200 Korean infants every year. This was the scene at Kennedy Airport in New York recently as six young couples gathered to greet the newest arrivals from Korea. Among them were a couple from northeastern Pennsylvania, Sid Michaels and his wife Linda. Sid and Linda first learned that a baby had been selected for them in early January. Since then, they've been sitting on pins and needles, wondering when that child would arrive. Well, the moment is finally here. In just a little while, they'll be welcoming four-month-old Lonnie Catherine to the United States. It feels like she's here forever. <laughs> it's so wonderful. <laughs> what do you think of her? Oh, she's beautiful. It's just like a picture. Sid, how does it feel being the proud papa? Tremendous. There, there's no feeling like it. I always wanted, after looking at that picture for so long, what it would be like. I felt like I knew her all this time. And, uh, well, she's finally here. <laughs> Based on the initial reaction of the grandparents, one thing Lonnie Catherine will not lack in this family is love. I know how excited mom and dad are over here, but what about yourself? Very excited, and she's real special. She's going to get all the love that we can give her. There's a little girl in Korea, 
that didn't believe in abortion. And that's so important to me. Look what we have, and look what she has. She gave us. That's all I will say. Looking back on the eight years they've been married, Sid and Linda consider themselves very fortunate. They've been blessed with a beautiful family, friends, nice home, just about everything you could ask out of life, with one exception. That one missing element was Lonnie Catherine. We have a nice life, we have a nice house and everything, and we've always had this piece missing from our puzzle, and now she fits right in. Lonnie is barely four months old, and already mom and dad have her life mapped out for her. Oh, she's going to go to St. Anne's school, and then she's going to go to prep, and she's going to play basketball and play the violin. And then when she gets old enough, she'll learn how to edit and to hold a microphone to do interviews. And then when she gets to be a senior in high school or a junior or a sophomore, she will, she'll play basketball and uh, get a scholarship. And then after that, well, she'll be on her own. <laughs> Lonnie Catherine has been a busy little girl these last few nights, keeping mom and dad wide awake. However, despite some sleepless nights, Sid and Linda still can't get over the child they've been blessed with. How does it feel as the new father to just see her there? Just a sense of peace and, and serenity and uh, satisfaction that the final peace is finally there. That's the March edition of 28 Magazine. I hope you enjoyed our program tonight. Our next report comes out Sunday, May 1st. I'm Vic Vetters. We'll see you then. This is 28 Magazine. In tonight's cover story, Bill Longworth on teamwork. Bill found that nowhere is teamwork more important than in an operating room where the surgery involves the human heart. Vince Sweeney takes us behind the scenes at a ski resort where he spends a day with the ski patrol. Rich Noonan, who wrote the first cover story for 28 Magazine last year, updates three unsolved murders. And the best of Gallagher's travels is a tale of tradition, toughness, and training tenderness. Sled dog racing. Hello, everybody. I'm Vic Vetters, and welcome to the February edition of 28 Magazine. This is our first anniversary issue, and it has been a really good year. We're proud to have been honored by the Pennsylvania Association of Broadcasters as the outstanding public affairs program of the state. Now, that award took teamwork. And teamwork is the subject of tonight's cover story. Bill Longworth tells us about some uncommon people who perform some relatively common surgery these days, heart bypass. The patient, 54-year-old Raymond Ramage, a retired phone company worker. In just over 12 hours, he'll undergo heart bypass surgery for the second time in 10 years. Members of Wilkesbury General's heart team are briefing their patient. Dr. Arthur Roberts is the lead surgeon. The catheterization showed that the bypass grafts from 10 years ago were uh, blocked up. Well, it's been 10 years after the first operation, and things went very well. That's, ten that's great a pretty good ten, result. Ten real good ones. The next morning, Ramage will undergo surgery. Open Heart bypass surgery is now the most common major surgery performed in this nation. This year alone, close to 200,000 people will undergo heart surgery. 
So it's, it's common on the one hand, but on the other hand, whenever the patient thinks about having open heart surgery, uh, it's enough to, to worry most people. And I'm, frankly, if I had to undergo open heart surgery with, with the knowledge that I have about open heart surgery, I'd be scared. But Roberts does point out heart bypass surgery in most cases is very successful. Arthur Roberts came to Wilkes-Barre General last year. He's a former college and pro football player who left his job as chairman of cardiothoracic surgery at Boston University Hospital to set up the Wilkes-Barre General Heart Team. He's getting high praise from his colleagues and Roberts loves his work. To be able to perform an operation which allows the patient to overcome the chest pain and offers the patient and the patient's family uh, months or years of a better quality of living is, uh, is very rewarding. As many as 10 people are directly involved with the surgery. It's a team effort. Everyone plays a crucial role. Dr. Thomas Ranieri is the anesthesiologist. It's his job to make sure the patient remains stable through surgery. That patient is Ray Ramage. Right now, he's, he's anesthetized, he's, he's at normal temperature, and um, just asleep and unconscious at this point. Usually, most patients are frightful that they're gonna wake up in the middle of the operation, and just basic reassurance helps them. As long, uh, also, they express the fear that they're not going to wake up at the end of the surgery. And again, reassurance is the only, the only thing we can do to help them out. The surgery begins. Doctors Antonio Sortino and Raj Devanini open the chest cavity. In this particular case, it will take a bit longer to get the chest cavity open. That's because the patient has been through this surgery before, and the doctors have to work through the scar tissue. A section of vein from Ray Ramage's leg will be removed. That vein will be used to bypass the blockages around the heart. Removing that vein must be done with extreme care because a mistake may cause problems for the patient later. The patient is going to depend upon this vein for the rest of his life. So any amount of injury is going to probably jeopardize the long-term function of the vein. The procedure is a success, and sections of this vein will soon carry blood around Ray Ramage's blocked arteries. The first successful heart bypass operation was performed in Cleveland more than 20 years ago, and today there's no question bypass surgery can improve the patient's quality of life. Dr. Arthur Roberts. That form of surgery is called palliative because uh, we don't actually take out the disease in the patient's coronary arteries. We leave it there. We bypass the blocks in the arteries. The surgeons yeah. usually know what to expect before the surgery begins. <laughs> this is a film of Ray Ramage's heart working. By looking at this, doctors can see the problem and begin work on a solution. And this shows the coronary artery, the left coronary artery, with one branch here and one branch here. There's major obstruction here and here. Once the operation is well underway, the doctors know where to look for the problems. In the case of Ray Ramage, they expect to perform triple bypass. Now we're all set to go on the hard lung machine. And this machine will keep Ray Ramage alive while the doctors work. Colleen Grandolski is the perfusionist. It's her job to make sure the machine runs properly, providing the necessary life support. I'm uh, going to be circulating his blood like he would, but I'm uh, oxygenating it for him while he's on the bypass machine. The one. Ice is placed on the heart to slow it down. Ramage's body temperature is then lowered with drugs and the heart is stopped. The surgeons will now take sections of the vein from his leg and sew it onto the heart. The vein is used to bypass the blockages. Through it all, the specially trained operating room nurses are assisting the doctors. Without their expertise, there would be no surgery. Rini Mike is one of those nurses. Surgery couldn't be done without us. With everything the doctors need, get the patient ready, make sure they have everything that they need. Can't do it without us. Ramage's heart is stopped for 67 minutes. The repairs are made and the heart is restarted. The surgeons end up performing four bypasses and the operation lasts for about five hours. 
Through it all, family members wait for news, and the waiting takes its toll. Mark LaMagdalene is the clinical coordinator. It's his job to update the family. That's a relief for Carolyn Ramage and her daughter Donna. They keep coming and telling you what stage they're on and that he's doing very well, so it makes you feel a lot better. After surgery, Dr. Roberts visits with the family, so and he brings so good. good news. The surgery is a success. Oh, that's a relief, I'm sure. The hardest part is sitting here and just, just waiting. After the operation, Ray Ramage has moved to the cardiothoracic intensive care unit. He is now on the road to recovery, but every vital function is monitored. If a problem develops, it can be spotted and corrected in a hurry. The first 48 hours are the most critical. If the patient remains stable in the intensive care unit, then recovery should begin quickly. Ray Ramage is still asleep. He's still under the effects of anesthesia. He'll come out of it within the next few hours. Three days later, he's feeling stronger and visiting with family. Yeah, a couple more days and I think we'll have it just about under control. Yep. The day of surgery is lost in Ray Ramage's mind, but when he wakes up, he remembers feeling the same way after bypass surgery 10 years ago. How did it feel when you came out of it? Well, Bill, that, uh, that old train that I told you was running down the tracks, it got me. <laughs> but we'll, uh, we'll overcome it. We'll get to every day you feel a little better. He is now home recovering. The doctors and nurses will meet new patients with new problems. The heart bypass surgery will continue. And for patients like Ray Ramage, the quality of life will improve. For 28 Magazine, I'm Bill Longworth. It's the largest winter rescue organization in the world, the National Ski Patrol. And over the years, they've saved the lives of countless skiers, thousands of injured ones, and all in all, made skiing a much safer sport. Tonight, Vince Sweeney takes us behind the scenes with the National Ski Patrol. So you ski, and you do it because it's fun, and that's good. And while you're skiing, you're probably not too concerned about your safety, and that's not so good. But fortunately for you, there is a group of people at Montage Mountain whose main concern is your safety. A group keeping a watchful eye over the winter sport, and their job is to keep the ski slopes safe. Think of them, if you will, as guardian angels of the snow. These angels are also known as members of the National Ski Patrol. This month, behind the scenes, travel to Montage Mountain to spend some time with the Ski Patrol. Alan Krauthamel is a seven-year veteran of the Ski Patrol, and he's a professional skier. He joined the patrol because he wanted to aid skiers who had had mishaps, and also because the Ski Patrol had once helped him. He told us how the patrol gets ready for a day of work on the busy slopes of Montage Mountain. Our day starts about an hour before the skiing public will arrive here and we go out and check all the trails, make sure that there's no obstacles or problems, you know, hazardous snow conditions and uh, make sure it's safe for the skiing public. Put any signs or markings up before the skiing public arrives to uh, direct them to easier terrain if need be and just make sure everything's safe. Although the safety record on Montage Mountain is very good, as it is at most ski resorts, there are the usual sprained ankles and bad spills. During our visit to Montage Mountain, members of the patrol reenacted an accident for behind-the-scenes photographer Andy Koch. And now, Alan Krothmull takes us step by step. An accident call will come in from one of the lifts or whoever reports it, and a patroller will respond to, to check out the scene. Upon arrival, he'll evaluate the patient and check them for injuries, find out who they're with, and. Uh, if they need assistance, we'll call for a toboggan additional equipment. And uh, we'll assist the skier off the hill and bring them into first aid. Where are you from, Jim? I'm, I'm from Scranton. Scranton? Yeah. How about there? Any pain? No, no. Okay. Stomach? No. How about your back? No. No tenderness? No. Okay. So for your left knee, right? Oh, yeah, right. Oh. Right there? And right above, too. Oh. Right there? Yeah. Call 75 to dispatch. Dispatch. Doing a good job. Oh. Uh, we're on section B of Spike. We need a sled down here. 10-4, we'll right down. 10-4. 
The Ski Patrol is a special group of men and women who, as we have just seen, work very hard on keeping ski resorts safe. Their calmness and ability to work under tense conditions is certainly not for the average skier. Members of the Ski Patrol are first tested on their skills, their skiing skills. Once they're accepted, they go through intensive and extensive training, learning first aid, how to move an injured skier, and if need be, how to save lives. And the unique thing about the Montage Ski Patrol is that with the exception of two full-time members and one part-time member, the other 70-plus members are strictly volunteers. Behind the scenes for 28 Magazine, I'm Vince Sweeney on Montage Mountain. By the way, this is the 50th anniversary of the National Ski Patrol. They not only take care of downhill areas, but cross-country trails, and one of the finest Nordic ski patrols is located at Crystal Lake, run by Roy Colley of Hughesville. Up next on 28 Magazine, Rich Noonan brings us up to date on our very first cover story. Unsolved murders. That was the cover story for our very first 28 Magazine a year ago. Reporter Rich Noonan traced three murders and the search for the killers. Tonight, a year later, we have this update. The three murders we told you about a year ago remain unsolved, but many things have changed. The men suspected of killing Joyce Ann Harding in September of 1985 are now in jail on other charges. A new district attorney has turned up the heat in the Betty Wolsifer killing, and last year state police had no suspects in the killing of Ricky Wolf. Today they do. We begin with the oldest murder. 25-year-old Joyce Ann Harding disappeared from Tunkhannock Township two and a half years ago. Her body was found a month later. She'd been shot in the head. Since then, police arrested Larry Robbins and Mark Conway, only to release the pair later for lack of evidence. Both men are now in jail on other charges in Philadelphia. The Wyoming County DA says within the past two weeks, investigators working on the Harding case went to Philadelphia to gather more evidence. In fact, I'd say in the last... Uh Two months, certainly from December 87 to the present time, it's, it's actually taken on uh, more activity than it had in the preceding year. I'm very much encouraged and uh, hopeful that 1988 will be the year in which uh, we'll finally see this get into court. The new district attorney of Luzerne County is Corey L. Stevens. During his campaign, he promised to resolve the Wolsifer case. Mrs. Wolsifer was found strangled in her Wilkesbury home August 30th of 1986. The woman's husband, Dr. Glenn Wolsifer, a local dentist, is the only suspect. In the past week, the new DA met with police to review the case. And I'm going to characterize the Wolsifer case as top priority, an open investigation, full of unanswered questions, but I want to let you know that we are going to move on this case and we're going to move forward on it. Mrs. Wolsifer's family is hoping the case will be solved before the second anniversary of Betty Wolsifer's death. Their pain is compounded knowing that someone once so close to them is the only suspect. Jack Tasker is the victim's brother. Yeah, it's very, very frustrating. The, the, the bottom line is uh, there has to be an answer, and, and that's the whole thing. Uh, the person who should be helping just just doesn't want to cooperate with police, and that's even more frustrating. In Northumberland County, Ricky Wool's family is offering a $4,000 reward for the capture of his killer. Investigators have within the week sent evidence to the FBI lab for testing, and within the month held meetings to work on the case. Northumberland County DA Bob Sakavich is hopeful. We sat around today and rededicated ourselves to solving what we believe is a solvable murder. Additional manpower has been committed to the Wolf case, and special tests have been done on Wolf's car looking for clues. It's going to undergo a laser application to see if we can come up with some other prints or other evidence that we previously uh, have been unable to uh, secure. Last year, at the end of our first 28 magazine cover story, we appealed to you, the public, for help in solving these murders. For without your help, these crimes could be unsolved at this time next year, which would mean another 12 months of pain for the victims' families and another year of freedom for the killers who now live among us. For 28 Magazine, I'm Rich Noonan. For years and years, the best way of getting around in the Alaskan wilderness has been sled dogs. Well, the tradition lives on here in northeastern Pennsylvania, but really, it is only a sport or a hobby. 
Tonight, in the best of Gallagher's travels, we'll meet a man and woman from Luzerne County who spent all their spare time raising, breeding, and racing these incredible animals. <laughs> Mel and Jim Hellier first saw a sled dog team in action in 1981. A year later, they started racing their own team and have been hooked ever since. And I like the uh, being out and outdoors and with the dogs, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. You know, it relaxes you. You just have no pressures when you're out there on the sled and working with the dogs. It's just like everyday life is is no longer existence. It's just you and your and your animals. They very seldom let you down. They, they love you and you can come back from a really rotten run and they're still licking your face and they're still licking your hand. So even if you decide that this isn't what you want to do, you still got your best friends out there with you. Training a championship sled dog starts from the day one is born. They have to get used to the idea of interacting with humans and other dogs. But the real work gets underway when they're about eight to 12 weeks old. What we do is we put the small harness on them and we put a, use a leash and a piece of wood or a two by four or something along that nature. Just wait behind them. You don't want to get too much weight because you don't want to discourage the dog from pulling. Uh, you have just about the right amount of weight just so he gets used to something being behind them. The key to putting together a championship team is a mutual respect between dogs and trainer. This is one competition where a driver is only as good as the team he commands. Well, you can be the best driver in the world, but if your dogs aren't going to move for you, <laughs> you're going to stay in the starting there chute. We go. There we go. You have to spend as much time and loving dedication towards the dogs so that it can be a 50-50 thing. They work and you work out on the trail. Yep. Yep. Your most important dogs are your leaders. You know, they, you have to have a relationship with them that you have with, that you do not have with any of the other dogs, uh, because the control is basically all by voice. You know, voice and the training that you put into them, and they have to respect you and trust you. Mel and Jim will never get rich racing these dogs. The prize money they take home only covers a fraction of their expenses. But they say the real reward in this competition is out on that trail working with a group of animals who are willing to give you their all. You're seeing a dog that is not basically a pet. It's a working animal and you are doing with it what it's designed and bred to do. I just love working with them and, and being able to see a dog when you put them in harness the minute they start to lean forward. You know, it's really attractive to me to see that in a dog that it's just basically instinct for them to pull. It's wonderful to be out on the runners and just proving what training that you've put into your dogs has finally come all together for you. Because it's, it's you proving what you, you can do through animals. It takes nearly two years before a young dog is even ready to join a team like this one. But Mel and Jim say it won't be long before these youngsters start racking up a few championships of their own. It's really basically an unbelievable feeling, you know, to see the pups as young, you know, struggling and see the determination in them at that instilled in them at that early age. I think you and Jim are going to be doing it for a few years. We're going to be 90 years old riding sled dogs. <laughs> We're going to be out there for, for a good long time. Reporting for 28 Magazine, I'm Dan Gallagher. Long after the snow is gone, in fact, in the summer, Mel and Jim will be training a new litter of Siberian Husky pups to continue the tradition. Well, that's our 28 magazine for February. Our next edition comes out Sunday, March 27th. If you have a suggestion, just drop us a line. In care of 28 magazine, post office box 28 in Wilkesbury, 18773. I'm Vic Vetters. Good night.